welcome to another weekend here on the platform. My name is Sam Omashe. Welcome to Big Talk. My guest today it needs no introduction. It's none other than Professor Pat Utomi. Welcome to this show. I'm glad to be here. Let us begin by looking at Nigeria at 61. And uh, it is uh, the boss these days. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to reflect on Nigeria gives you bittersweet uh, feelings, uh, memories of good times, uh, memories of very difficult times and challenges. Uh, but, but the start was an optimistic one. I mean, uh, if you look at what happened, I mean, take it as cue. Uh, when the civil war started in Nigeria about seven years into independence. Yes. And the uh, way that the European and American academics tended to treat it was uh, primitive tribalism, war breaks out in Africa, kind of thing. Now, two um, scholars, uh, Michigan State at the time, uh, Robert Nelson and Howard Wolpe. Uh, I remember Howard Wolpe actually nearly became Africa, Assistant Secretary for Africa yes. under Clinton or so. Um, they were both very appalled by that perception of, of Africa because they had worked in Nigeria and so they, they wrote a book on modernization in Nigeria and they, they talked about what was going on that led to the civil war in Nigeria as not necessarily a primitive tribalism but competition between ethnic nationality groups, their leadership on who would most bring progress to their people and they called that phenomenon competitive communalism. And if you look at how it unfolded, you will see that it brought progress to Nigeria. Uh, I'll take three uh, kind of areas to use to illustrate this. One, education. Western Nigeria, under Chivahalo, quick to realize how much education mattered. Move quickly with a, um, a program of universal free primary education. Zeke moving back east, tried to respond, got a pushback from civil servants who said, look, we can't afford it. The, the West earns a lot more from cocoa than we earn from palm produce. And Zeke thought that they were sabotaging his government, in fact, as much as said so in parliament. And the palm sector in finance at the time, Chief Jerome Doji got very upset, tried to resign, but was encouraged to just take a leave to go and cool off. By the time he got to London for his rest, John Hood had offered him an executive position and all of that. Mm. But delegations came from the East to say, ah, you can't betray the course. And anyway, he returned to the service. And the East found a creative way. And that creative way involved a collaboration between the communities, the government, and the missionary um, the missionaries. And the phenomenon in Igbo is called Igbo Danda which is, you know, so that the weight does not weigh down the ants. Yes. You know, the worker ants. Balance. Yes. yes. And it made the Igbo State Union perhaps the biggest proprietor of schools in Nigeria at that time. Uh, um, and and so, so that's edu education. Uh, of course, the North in education wasn't so big. But the other area, industrialization. Uh, if, if you read Paris Okibo and his work on Nigerian public accounts, he will tell you that the marketing boards, which essentially were the basis on which the uh, produce business, export business was managed, had huge reserves in their foreign accounts in 1956. But by independence, of course, self-government having come between 56 and 57, these accounts were drawn down to zero. Why did they get drawn down? Because those new Nigerian leaders were desperate to industrialize Nigeria because colonial Nigeria had done no industrializing at mm. all. Mm. I think there were only two factories for, for a fact, I think in Nigeria, Nigerian breweries and the Federated Motor Industries. Um, and so they invested massively in industrializing Nigeria, led to significant new growth. Uh, uh, once again, I will all moved with the Kenya Industrial Estate. Uh, Okwara responded with Aba and transamadi in Port Harcourt, mm. and uh, the Sadawana responded with 
Kikuri in, in, in Kaduna, mm. because Bompai was already a traditional entrepreneurial hub in Kano. Oh, yeah. So that all led to rapid industrialization in Nigeria. I mean, all these South Koreas and co were lagging behind us in industrialization. Yes. You know, um, uh, you, you could, you know, take other examples of the nature of this competition, but let's just leave, leave it with these two. Uh, what then happened as we got on this journey, this competition became too, too, how do you put it, too tense. And a group of young army officers who didn't have the tools to think these things through properly, got excited, jumped in the fray, a coup d'etat in 1966, ah, created a trajectory that we paid dearly for. One of the most terrible things about that trajectory is really how I introduced the comings of state capture into Nigeria. Yeah. And, and how did that happen? See, the nature of military rule is a command structure. Uh, the big general at the top, the colonels who get sent out, it's a different thing from when there's a premier in a region engaging a prime minister. In fact, the logic was that the Sadana sent his deputy to the center yes. as against the general at the top sending Scum. his vassals yes. to the places. So his word became law. And people who don't understand the discussions of uh, federal, fiscal federalism and restructuring and all of these things can't see how this will happen. In the 60s, Eastern Nigeria, for example, would collect the rent from oil and send 50% up to the federal government. By the time the big general at the top was in charge, and that's why I talk about the dangerous alchemy of soldiers and oil. Yeah. That's what sank Nigeria. They just basically collected the whole thing at the center yes. and gave and gave prebends, as my friend Richard yes. Joseph would call it, yes. to, 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 to the colonels running the states. Yes. Yes. And they themselves had to also manage it the way they wanted. Absolutely. <laughs> so they didn't bother us with taxes. We didn't bother them with uh, governing well. Yeah. And yeah, uh, you, you, you made a good point about about the socio-economic uh, dynamic uh, as the country moved towards the mid-1960s. Now, the issue of military, the military coming in itself was what we call state capture. But these people, these economic indices that you call competition going on, hmm was not working in tandem with political corruption mm. that was going on. Mm. So we had a situation where the politics was not really sensitive to the economics. Mm. So how did it happen that the economics and the, the, the culture itself had to yield to political adventurism? Well, I'm trying to understand the context. Especially because, military adventurism. Yeah. yeah. You see, what happened when the military came was that the military had to rationalize their coming. There is nowhere, no matter how powerful a force is, that you take over a government without trying to rationalize why you have done. Because legitimacy is the most fundamental attribute of governance. So the military had to rationalize they are coming to earn legitimacy. And part of the way they rationalized they are coming was to put themselves forward as a man on the horseback, Desire. modernizing, okay? Um, and so, in fact, what led to my, the focus of my own PhD thesis was to see if in any way what happened, what was happening in Nigeria resembled what the Argentine uh, scholar Grujamo O'Donnell yeah. tried to, to model in his idea of uh, bureaucratic authoritarianism and excluding authoritarian coalition focused on modernization. Mm. Did that happen? In many ways, because of the nature of the relationship between the, a group of very smart civil servants of that time uh, who generally got called super permanent secretaries and General Gowan, uh, there was a sense in which one could imagine a bureaucratic authoritarian coalition emerging, 
But some other officers were very jealous of that relationship. And that actually sank Nigeria in many ways. The Alison Ayidas, Philippa Siodos, yeah. uh, Ahmed Jordas, yeah. Ibrahim Demchidas, Ime Bongs had general government's ears because they, they made sense uh, most of the time, clearly. Uh, that did not go down too well with some of the commanders, uh, like Mutala Mohamed, for example. All of this led to the overthrow of Golan, mm -hmm. the rationalizations and all these things notwithstanding. Among other factors. Yes. <laughs> you know, when Golan was then replaced, <laughs> those who replaced him wanted to get back at these powerful mm -hmm. palm sex. But it's a very complex, it's a shame that I have not written a book about this. In fact, mm -hmm. Chief Asiodo was telling me the other day that, you know, even General Gowan said to me, because I, I interviewed all of them when I was writing my PhD thesis. Yeah. Look, why didn't you do this? I'm trying now, 40 years, because my PhD thesis will be 40 years next year. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> to re, to do a longitudinal study. And take cast. And cast, yes. Yes. From where uh, uh, it was 40 years ago. What, what then, it seemed to me, uh, evolved out of that, well, bit of pessiness was let's get these civil servants, they, they were corrupt. Believe me, they were exaggerated stories mm. of corruption, mm. very exaggerated. And they purged the service and did so much damage, the civil service has not recovered from it till today. Um, so that really was the, the, the critical point between perceptions of corruption. I mean, yes, there was some corruption, like, what about there's politics? And it's going to be okay, how do you fund parties? How do you do this? So they were 10 percenters, as they were called. That but, was in Zogo. <laughs> yes, yeah, so called the 10 percenters. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the military eventually became 80 percenters. 80 percenters. <laughs> and now it's over 100 percent. Oh, yeah. Because they do. Uh, they do a review of the contract halfway, and then they, they add more, yeah. and, then, and, and the project is still not ended. The, the, <laughs> of course, I'm sure you're familiar with this stereotype story <laughs> of, uh, of the Indonesian minister. Yeah. And, and this joke was told me by an Indonesian minister, a former oil minister of Indonesia, uh, uh, um, Professor Sadli. Uh, Professor Mohamed Sadli, I was visiting him in Jakarta once, and he told me this funny story. I, this, man had retired as oil minister of Indonesia and he was living in a bungalow. He didn't even have a condition as yeah. fan was brewing. Mm. At, you know, as like, like, like he read my, what I was thinking yeah. as I sat in his living room. He told the story. So, you know, the story about uh, the corrupt Indonesian, you know, we talk about Indonesia. Minister comes to Nigeria. Uh, Nigerian minister comes to Indonesia and he says to him, how did you manage to build this house? He said, you see, you see that bridge over there? 10% of it is yes. this house. <laughs> so he comes to Nigeria. He's a Nigerian minister. Looks like, you see that bridge over there? He said, where is it? The bridge that would have been no, over there. 100% of it is in this house. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so, so anyway, so anyway um, this is uh, um, corruption thing. Yes got progressively worse because of state capture. What's state capture really here? The control that the military had over institutions of state hmm. were almost so complete and they could get away with murder that as they took on more and more and more, at a point gold displacement became so much that Public goals were put aside for private goals. Um, I have so many stories to tell on these matters. Uh, um, perhaps that's not for a short program like this. But, you know, I, I wrote a case study uh, once about um, a flour mill in Nigeria and how the flour mill industry went through all these problems. And I invited the managing director of Flamings of Nigeria at the time, uh, the later Musu, mm. to sit in on the class uh, when I touched the case. And after discussing 
vertical uh, uh, integration, horizontal challenges, this, that, 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 that. It was a, a very elegant conversation. <laughs> My Muslim said, you know, fantastic, you know, this small problem that I didn't see in this conversation is that, you know, um, one powerful general had the desire to make some small change. And you know, if you have power, you can always get a, a waiver. Yes. So if there's something banned, and at that time, importing um, wheat was banned mm -hmm. so that the flour milling industry could thrive. You could not import wheat, but you could Im import, uh, sorry, you couldn't import flour, but you could import wheat to mill into flour. So um, a friend of this powerful general uh, came to him and said, look, get me a waiver, let's make some money, bring in some, he said, okay, ask your friends to ship the, the wheat. Um, for the wheat, we had some sheep coming to Nigeria. I said, I'll get the waiver before. And then one particular general who was very stubborn was in office. And flour millers heard about it and ran to, to him and said, look, this is what is about to happen. And he threatened the Ministry of Commerce that if he hears of any waiver, they will end up in Babich. <laughs> so nobody dared give a waiver. So these shiploads waited at the edge of Nigerian waters for a while and had to turn back and go. Well, not too long after that, there was a coup d'etat. And the powerful ones were now in power. They were, you know, and the first thing they did was to punish, no, it was to punish the family industry by banning the importation of wheat itself and ask them to grow wheat locally. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sometimes personal egos, personal interests are conflated with national interests. And, and, and that's what state capture really is about, yes. the gold displacements that take place. Yes. Uh, the South Africans. Or what uh, Ake, Ake used to describe as the privatization of the public square. Cloud Ake, a man yeah. greatly after my heart. Yes. God bless his soul. Uh, uh, yeah. That, that happened so much under the military. And um, well, Nigeria went through that season. Obviously, uh, at a point in time, it was not working for Nigeria. But one cannot dismiss completely all the choices made. I know, for example, that General uh, Ibrahim Babangida gets beaten up a lot. Yeah. There are many things he probably did wrong, in my view, regarding how he allowed culture to get you know, contaminated yes. by a laser fair attitude. Yeah. But there were things he did right that people don't give him enough credit. You know, as I look at the foreign exchange crisis Nigeria is going through today, Nigeria was in a structural logjam, was in a debt crisis, and the foreign exchange market did not exist. The allocation couldn't find them enough dollars to allocate. It bred a lot of corruption. It bred problems in manufacturing, economy was in a seizure. <laughs> My academic left economists. Yeah. You know, in those days, they used to call me bourgeois apologists. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Some of us used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you would not understand markets and how they work. <laughs> so, my academic kind of, uh, left friends were on top of this case and uh, Babangida cleverly manipulated everybody around the idea of a structural adjustment program, program and created a market for foreign exchange. Yes. That saved us so much over the years. Until recently, we ourselves unwound the market and we're in a mess. But anyway, that's, uh, uh, I wish people understood economics just a little more. We won't be in most of the mess that we are in. Because these people are not wicked people. They just think they're clever, or can I build it? but they don't see the effect, the consequence overall. Shortly but after. Today, but today the dollar is uh, almost 600. That's what I'm saying. It was caused by us. It was caused by dirigist thinking that infected policy from about 2015. All right. From Military messianism, it turned out that we became a people 
searching for a solution. And it became them against us first, before it turned out to be us against us. And it has been a real challenge since. But, but you see, uh, and in some ways, people say I, I shouldn't say that, that I don't deserve to do that to myself. In a way, I take part of the blame. I mean, we fought the military at the time that this um, June 12 crisis took place. You know, I, I don't know if you recall a piece I wrote, the title we must say never again, because what sports the founding of the concerned professionals. And, yes. and we, professionals came out, we were on the streets, we were buying full pages of newspapers two, three times a week, going after the government and so on and so forth. But eventually the military gave up and ran after Abacha's death. There were many who came to us and said, look, all those things you guys were writing, why don't you just found a party, move in, and do those things? We had a debate, and that debate took place in office I used to have on a Dote Law in Victoria Island. And um, the long and short of the conversation was, the greater majority said, look, we're professionals, we're not politicians, let's go back to our businesses, and let's hope politicians, having learned their lessons, can now take over the country and run it well. Unfortunately, the politicians did not think the military were sincere. The original politicians, you know, have certain values, understood the game and all of that. And so they did not want to move. What happened, therefore, was that the bad men of the military moved into this open space. And sadly for all of us, shortly after President Obasanjo got to power, oil prices that we had single digits under Abacha went to triple digits. Plenty of money. And these ill-prepared new leaders pocketed most of the money and used money to raise a barrier of entry into politics. Those traditional politicians couldn't get back in. Even when we saw that the mess was bad, many of us said, okay, nah, 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 we made a mistake. Because I remember after that meeting in my office, uh, we were standing outside and Donald Duke came to me and said, I don't care what you guys are saying, I'm going to go and organize Cross River and, and all of that. And they did it well between Donald, Gershom, Liel. They got Cross River. Um, the, 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 those of us who then thought we had made a mistake, that maybe we should redeem ourselves. It was too late. These fellows who now call themselves Sheik and all kinds of funny things, used money to block entry into politics. And Nigeria has been downhill since then. Um, so I think that there is a sense in which... It shows that, it shows that the, you guys ought to remain as professional because you didn't know the game. <laughs> because that's always been like that. No, no, but, but, the, but the original politicians didn't yeah. move forward either. Oh, they are followers yeah, of our law. They were not they were wary. Of they were wary. That's precisely that's precisely and the point. The soldiers took over the space in different guises. In different guises. That's absolutely yeah. the point. Yes. And, and so, and we are all paying the price for it. The second part of this interview will air next week. So stay tuned. My poem on Beer Sharibu will be read to you now. Leah, what a world we live in. Death smells from empty ports as from empty minds. But empty ports are better because we only starve. Empty minds seed wisdom to the hands and muscles. They take our families to abattoirs before we say goodbyes. Thank you for being on this show. You can join me on my column at www.samomashai.com and until next week, be good.